American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Mary Edmonia Lewis, a brilliant sculptor who had to leave the country to find a place where she could pursue her art simply as an artist and not a category. Right. She was in her 60s when she died, but she hadn't lived full time in the United States since her early 20s. And the reason she had to flee her home country was because she was black. And by her own testimony, she needed to work in a place where she was not constantly reminded about her color. Her father was Haitian African and her mother was Chippewa. She was born sometime in the mid 1840s on the Ojibwa Reservation near Albany, New York. Her Chippewa name was Wildfire, and her older brother was called Sunrise. But by the time Wildfire was 10, their parents had died, and they were orphans. They were taken in by a couple of their mother's sisters who lived further west in New York State, near Niagara Falls. It was here that Wildfire was given the name Mary Edmonia Lewis, and was baptized Catholic. She actually lived a fairly wild life through her early years, fishing, running through the woods, and living up to her name. Later in life, she confessed that it was only her passion for sculpting that made it possible for her to live in a city and not return to her beloved woods. She and her aunts, who were also Chippewa, of course, made things like moccasins, baskets, leather goods, and headdresses to sell to tourists at Niagara Falls. These were things she would have been making from an early age as a child in her Chippewa tribe, but it's telling that her first experience of making money was selling handmade items like these. Certainly a harbinger of things to come. So she initially went to Baltimore for school, where she attended a school run by an order of black nuns. Now, this school and order of nuns are not explicitly named in anything that I came upon. But, given the years, that had to have been St. Francis School, which was founded and run by Mother Mary Lang and her Oblate Sisters of Providence. This was the first Catholic school for black girls in the country, and we'll certainly talk about Mother Lang and St. Francis in a future episode. Following her time there, she went to a Baptist college preparatory school in McGrawville, New York, that was associated with the abolitionist movement. It was there that she first became acquainted with many prominent abolitionist figures. These people would figure in later work, whether as a subject, as a patron, or as a supporter. Her interest in art, and particularly sculpting, seems to have been inspired during a visit to Boston, where she was impressed by the many public sculptures. She received a good enough education that she qualified to enroll at Oberlin College in Ohio, the first integrated college in the United States, in 1859. Her education through all of this was paid for by her brother, Sunrise, who by this point had made a lot of money in the California gold rush and as a barber in Montana. Her time at Oberlin was initially great. She studied art, made friends, and was active among the abolitionist circles. But even at very progressive Oberlin, there were bad eggs. One evening, disaster struck for Mary. Two of her roommates took very ill, and it was decided that they had been poisoned. Blame fell on Mary, and she found herself facing public suspicion and eventually criminal charges. She also suffered a brutal attack from some vigilantes who had wanted to teach the black girl a lesson. She was left for dead in a field, but she survived the attack to see her day in court. She was acquitted of the charges, but everything was changed. She never escaped the ruling of guilty in the court of public opinion, and Oberlin, the town and the college, became unwelcoming. She was denied the opportunity to enroll for classes for her final semester, so she left Oberlin and eventually settled in Boston, again with her brother's financial assistance. 
It was in Boston that she determined to become a sculptor full time. She began with portrait medallions and busts of abolitionist figures like Wendell Phillips, John Brown, and Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who had led the all black Massachusetts 54th Regiment during the Civil War. If you remember the film Glory, he was played there by Matthew Broderick. It was her bust of Shaw that really grabbed people's attention and changed her life. The skill that went into it was apparent to all, but even in progressive and anti-slavery Boston, people were awed about acknowledging that a black woman could be credited with having so much ability. One reason for this was that women in general, not just black women, were disallowed from studying anatomy and getting some of the training that aided white male sculptors to really hone the craft of sculpting. Lewis was denied this, but she was helped by a mentor, the sculptor Edward Brackett, who helped her to set up her own studio and realize her abilities. Fortunately for Lewis, sales of copies of the bust of Shaw financed a trip abroad. So when she was 22, she embarked for London, Paris, and eventually Rome. Once she was in Rome, she stayed. It was there that she made her life and her art until the very end. And Rome was the perfect place for her in more ways than one. First, the Eternal City had a far more Catholic view of race. She said it was in Rome that she found a real republic where people left their race prejudices at home. She said, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. The land of liberty had no room for a colored sculptor. Yes. And second, her Catholic faith flourished in Rome. Again, she'd been baptized Catholic when she went to live with her aunts near Niagara Falls, but she'd not been in a particularly Catholic environment since she left Mother Lang's school in Baltimore. Even Boston was still very much Protestant-dominated at this point. The Irish Catholic ascendancy was decades away. But in Rome, surrounded by the church in all her splendor, and especially surrounded by all of the amazing art that the church possesses and makes available to the public, she was affirmed in her faith. In Italy, she became friends with a community of artists, many of them Americans, but she largely worked alone. She also was different in that she did her own chiseling when it came time to execute the actual sculpture. Most sculptors who worked in marble would produce their sculptures in clay or plaster, and then hire some of the many skilled stone workers to take what they had done and produce it in marble. But Lewis did this herself. Some say she did this because she rarely had the money it would take to hire such stone workers. But it's more likely that she both wanted to make sure she retained that final artist's touch on the works, and also she wanted to avoid even the possibility of a thought that she wasn't actually the artist behind her works. There was enough skepticism of a black woman, especially one as tiny as she was, she was reportedly only about four feet tall, being a great sculptor that she did not want to give anyone any additional reason to doubt it. And she really had mastered her craft. She adopted the neoclassical style full of mythology and Greek and Roman motifs. But she brought a particularly American and African story to it. When she sculpted the Magi, for instance, the most prominent figure was the king from Africa, rather than either the Caucasian or Asiatic, as was more typical. Another very prominent work, Forever Free, depicted two black American slaves, a man and a woman, rising from their broken chains, full of hope for a brighter future. She also continued doing portrait busts, as she did when Ulysses S. Grant came to her Rome studio and sat for her. She also did a bust of Abraham Lincoln. Others who visited her in her studio but did not sit for a bust included Pope Pius IX and, later, Frederick Douglass. 
She also did a bust of the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but this wasn't from him sitting in her studio. She executed it from sketches she did of him as she surreptitiously followed him around Rome when he came for an extended stay. This was a bit of fangirling on her part because she had earlier done a series of busts based on Longfellow's poem, The Song of Hiawatha. Her bust of Longfellow was eventually purchased by Harvard University. During the 1860s and 1870s, she established a terrific reputation in America and in Europe and received commissions from many wealthy and well-known people. But she didn't forget about her own earlier struggles and those of her fellow female artists. In 1871, she told one interviewer, I have a strong sympathy for all women who have struggled and suffered. For this reason, the Virgin Mary is very dear to me. But it was a figure who is very different from the Blessed Mother, who was the subject of her most powerful and most striking work. This massive sculpture, which took her four years, was The Death of Cleopatra. It is a nearly three-ton sculpture that depicts the Egyptian queen seated on her throne just moments after her suicide by Asp. Her head is back and turned to the side. Her arms are splayed open with one hanging over the side of the chair and her right breast is exposed. In 1876, she had this monolithic work shipped to the United States so it could be considered for the centennial exhibition in Philadelphia. It was accepted and placed in the hall reserved for American artists. The work caused a bit of a sensation. Many thought it was a remarkable achievement in marble. Others thought it far too graphic. It was certainly more European realism than was typical in the United States, where the Puritan ideas still held sway. One artist wrote, The effects of death are represented with such skill as to be absolutely repellent, and it is a question whether a statue of the ghastly characteristics of this one does not overstep the bounds of legitimate art. The massive sculpture, unfortunately, did not sell during the exhibition, and Lewis didn't have the money to bring it back with her to Italy, so it had to be boxed up and put into storage. And from there, it was lost to the world of art for more than a century. Yes, and it has a very interesting history. Cleopatra became a centerpiece in a Chicago saloon, and then was purchased by a gambler and racehorse owner to be used as a grave marker for a favorite racehorse named Cleopatra. And there it sat for a long time. The land on which it sat was eventually purchased by the Postal Service, and Cleopatra was moved to a construction yard in, of all places, Cicero, Illinois. There she was subjected to weather, graffiti, abuse, and garish paint jobs done by Boy Scouts to cover the graffiti. Eventually, she was acquired by a local historical society who had some inkling of the significance of the sculpture, and they stored her in a local shopping mall. It wasn't until the 1980s that the sculpture's real significance was realized. Since then, restoration efforts based on photos from the original showings have brought Cleopatra closer to her original form, and she now sits at the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. Over her many years, Lewis produced more than 100 sculptures. Many of them were done on commission for Americans, particularly Americans in the abolitionist movements, and most of which are lost. Her last known sculpture was actually completed in 1883. But she lived for another 25 years almost. She actually remained a very private person. Even when she displayed her work or talked about herself, she was very careful in what she said to whom presenting an autobiographical sketch of herself carefully crafted to the audience to which she was presenting it. It seemed that she wanted to make sure she retained her own story and didn't let others write it so long as she could help it. Well, she had endured so many people assuming so many things about her when she was younger. She didn't want that to be the reality for her entire life. She was not interested in being seen as a black artist or a female artist, but just as an artist, pure and simple. She was a formidable artist. She was not afraid of pitting her artistic talents against anyone else's, and she even did reproductions of Michelangelo's masterpieces, something most artists would shy away from, feeling that the master sculptor of them all was far beyond their abilities. Lewis dove in and received positive reviews on her attempts. 
Lewis moved to London in 1901, where she lived out her final years. In London, she remained devoutly Catholic, walking regularly the half-mile to assist at Mass at Our Lady of Victory Church in Kensington. It was in London that she died in September of 1907. Her known works of art have been included in various exhibitions and museums over the 100-plus years since her death, with works now residing in the Smithsonian, Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Cleveland Museum of Art, many other museums around the world, as well as who knows how many private collections. Lewis's place in art history is cemented by her work, which speaks for itself but her own story has largely remained buried in history until the last few decades. Since the 1970s, scholars and biographers have been sifting through her many different versions of her own story, trying to get to the facts. They've come to be more sure about some things than they were before, like her birth having been almost certainly in 1844. But while all of these facts are still up for debate, one thing remains indisputable about America's first great black female artist. Mary Edmonia Lewis was a devout Catholic. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. And we ask you to consider supporting the work of SQPN. Yes, now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter when you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a new patron at $10 per month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all of our shows, including American Catholic History, making your gift go even further. If you've been thinking about becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. To learn more about Mary Edmonia Lewis, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, please visit sqpn.com slash history. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest.